Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Once again, we're in the very ending books and chapters of our trip through the Bible. This time we're going to look at what is in the little book of Jude. It's a very small book. In Jude, starting with uh, verse 7, uh, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah and how, the evil, how they gave themselves over to very evil things. Then in verse 8, he says, Likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Where's he going? It's a whole lot of mouthful. There's a lot of <laughs> stuff going on there. Um, I'm gonna, since Jude is such a short book, and we're going to also maybe touch back to 2nd and 3rd John, which we didn't cover last time. Those are also very short books. But we're going to focus on Jude here because there's a lot of stuff to think about here. I'm going to read the whole book, and just, it'll just take a couple of minutes. My dear friends, I was, going, I was doing my best to write to you about the salvation we share in common. Apparently, he was going to write a book in some, at some length, really spelling out what he thought the gospel was. When I felt the need of writing at once to encourage you to fight on for the faith which once and for all God has given to his people, he said, there wasn't time for me to sit down and carefully work out everything. Boy, I had to jump in with both feet. For some godless people have slipped in unnoticed among us, persons who distort the message about the grace of our God in order to excuse their immoral ways and who reject Jesus Christ, our only Master and Lord. Long ago, the scriptures predicted the condemnation they have received. Now, we last time in our discussion of First John noticed some people who said, you know, this Jesus can't be fully God and fully, fully human being. That's not possible. So here's an example. They, they've rejected that idea. For even though you know all this, I want to remind you of how the Lord once rescued the people of Israel from Egypt, but afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And of course, that's the story of the desert wanderings. Remember the angels who do not stay within the limits of their proper authority, but abandon their own dwelling place. They are bound with eternal change in the darkness below where God is keeping them for that great day on which they will be condemned. So he's got everybody being condemned here, doesn't it? Remember Sodom and Gomorrah, here's another group, and the nearby towns whose people acted as those angels did and indulged in sexual immorality and perversion. They suffer the punishment of eternal fire as a plain as a plain warning to all. So look out, the fires of Sodom and Gomorrah are coming, right? <laughs> and now the verses you read, Norm, I'll read from my Good News Bible. In the same way also, these people have visions which make them sin against their own bodies. So apparently there were some people imagining visions. Mm -hmm. They despise God's authority and insult the glorious beings above. Not even the chief angel Michael did this. Notice this verse carefully. In his quarrel with the devil when they argued about who would have the body of Moses, Michael did not dare to condemn the devil with insulting words, but said, The Lord rebuke you. He didn't waste any time. He just says, Stand back. Lord, Lord rebuke you. But these people attack with insults anything they do not understand, and those things that they know by instinct like wild animals are the very things that destroy them. How terrible for them. They have followed the way that Cain took. For the sake of money, they have given themselves over to the error that Balaam committed. They have rebelled, rebelled as Korah rebelled, and like him, they were destroyed. 
with their shameless carousing there like dirty spots in your fellowship meals. They take care only of themselves. Does that sound like the selfishness we talked about in 1 John? They are like clouds carried along by the wind, but bringing no rain. They are like trees that bear no fruit, even in autumn. Trees that have been pulled up by the roots and are completely dead. I mean, you know, you can tell that he really loved these people, didn't he? <laughs> they are like wild waves of the sea with their shameful deeds showing up like foam. They are like wandering stars for which, whom God has reserved a place forever in the deepest darkness. It was Enoch, the seventh direct descendant from Adam, who long ago prophesied this above the, about them. The Lord will come with many thousands of his holy angels to bring judgment on all, to condemn them all for the godless deeds they have performed and for all the terrible words that godless sinners have spoken against him. These people are always grumbling and blaming others. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others in order to get their own way. So, but remember, my friends, what you have been told in the past by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what have we seen so far? He's condemning these people who are corrupting the church and so forth. He says, but remember Jesus. They said to you, they said to you, when the last days come, people will appear who will mock you, people who follow their own godless desires. These are the people who cause divisions, who are controlled by their natural desires, who do not have the spirit. But you, my friends, keep on building yourselves up on your most sacred faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and keep yourselves in the love of God as you wait for our Lord Jesus in his mercy to give you eternal life. Show mercy towards those who have doubts. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. And to others show mercy mixed with fear, but hate their very clothes stained by their sinful lusts. And then he ends with a fabulous doxology. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to bring you faultless and joyful before his glorious presence to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority from all ages past and now and forever and ever. Amen. That's the whole book of Jude. You know, he seems to be talking about people who are using excess words and um, complaining and, well, just debating. That's like our political world does and that's like our internet world does. Um, and where Jesus, uh, Michael the archangel, just came and said a simple, the Lord rebuke you. He didn't argue. He didn't uh, go on and on and on and on and on. Sometimes I think that's what's wrong with us today is we're going on and on and on. And he seems to say, uh, he doesn't be don't, around the bush don't do that. This whole letter fit on one piece of papyrus. One piece. Yeah. And he seems to be saying, do good deeds. Just shut up your mouth and, and do good deeds. And avoid these corruptors. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's go back and talk just a little bit about who this Jude was. Do we know anything about him? They refer to him as uh, James' brother, the, the brother of James the well, Just. He, he says that, doesn't he? Yeah. From Jude, servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. James. The Just. Okay. So who is this James. James seems to be the brother of the actual brother, half-brother, or otherwise of Jesus himself. And, and here Jude puts himself, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. He's getting himself in the proper place. Yeah. Really exactly. called, and is really called uh, Jacob. 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 But remember, the real names here, James is really, James, yes. James, is Jacob, James is really yeah. Jacob, and Jude here is really in Judas. Greek is Judas. Judas. Judas, like the disciple Judas, but it comes from the Hebrew name Judah. So we have, we have what we really have here is Judah, the brother of Jacob. And, and so that no one misunderstands, I know most people will not. But this Judas is a different Judas than Judas Iscariot. Yes. So even God is kind of kind here to everyone with the name Judas or Judah. He's, he's telling them there's another one, a good one. Yeah. Okay, so, so who is this? Do we know? Th this is a half-brother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. it, would it be an older brother then, an older half-brother? We talked about that when we were over in the book of James. Look at Matthew 13, verse 55. Matthew 13, verse 55. And Jesus had gone back to, Ma to Nazareth, remember, and he, he preached a sermon there. And they were all impressed at the beginning, and then by the end they were ready to stone him. 
And verse 55, isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't his Mary his mother? And aren't James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas his brothers? So this was a st older stepbrother of, of Jesus, mm -hmm. and J as James was. James was, because he's always mentioned first, he was probably the oldest stepbrother, and Judas was the youngest stepbrother. So this Judas was probably the closest to Jesus in, in age as they grew up. Okay, so that's who we're talking about here. Do we know what his ministry was or where he was living? Almost nothing. Almost nothing. Okay. No. But we notice something interesting. There's a very close similarity between particularly chapter 2 of, well, I, I shouldn't say that. It's, it's quite a bit of chapter 1, 2, and 3 are very similar to portions of Jude. Why do you think that is? Chapter 1, 2, and 3 of what? Of Peter, Second Peter, oh Peter. Second Peter, uh, one, two, and three have are very close parallels to Jude. In fact, some verses are almost verbatim. Which person lived first? They both lived at the same time. And Peter was in prison when he wrote Second mm -hmm. Peter. Yes. So he had a feeling of urgency to get the message out. Yeah. How about Jude? Here. But the yeah. But Jude quotes Second Peter, so that's why some I don't understand which came first, the chicken or the egg. <laughs> yeah, um, the scholars that I con consulted when I was working on them, the handouts here. By the way, these handouts, if you want to read them, there's a handout for every book of the Bible. Sooner or later, will be all available on our website. It's theox t h e o x dot o r g. So a lot of this material we're talking about is available if you want to go online. Once again, that's www.theox.org. Um, well, why does Jude parallel Peter then? Actually, many people believe that Jude was written first and Second Peter borrowed from him. And I think probably it's a function of... I mean, there's only two ways that, that people could you know, apparently borrow from other people. What are those two ways? Can you think about them? Verbally. Well, I mean, in, you know, I'm not talking about the difference between verbally and writing. I'm saying oh. if, if you say something, then I say something that's almost exactly the same. Either I'm copying you, or there's one other possibility. What's the other possibility? We're both copying the same thing. Yes. We're both copying from something from, from a third person, yeah. from a third source. Now, in here, we'll talk about this a little bit later, um, it... He quotes Enoch. Where's the book of Enoch? And what about Moses being fought over by the angel? Yeah, where did that come from? We've got some things to talk about, don't we? Yes. Okay. Where does it come from? It comes from here. <laughs> yeah. Well, but if we didn't have this verse here in Jude about their fighting over the body of Moses, we would wonder, we would expect that Moses would be where? In the grave? Still in the grave. In the grave buried, right? Yeah, exactly. But so, we know, so sorry what happened? You, the transfiguration. So why is that a problem? We got it. Well, we have it a, pro we have it a problem here. Where did he get it? He it, didn't say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but look, look, we've, got, we've got two things mixed up here. <laughs> why do I think I have to know? Well, I'd like to know, <laughs> this is because if he could find a way to, to find, dig out these things out, out and I would like to dig out some things, too. Well, but here, let's, let's be honest about this. When did, uh, well, when did Moses live? A long time ago. Okay, well, about 1,400 years. 1450 B.C. For, somewhere, 1,500 to about 1,400 and, well, 1,480 or something like that. I mean, 1,380 uh, B.C. Okay, that's when Moses lived. Jude is writing here in the middle of the first century A.D. That's 1,500 years later. Yes. Where did he get this information about Moses? That's my question. Now, I know. I'm, I'm spelling it out, I'm spelling it out for also, you. Also, there was no one there at the time. It could no. not be passed down from person to person. There was no one there. Well, this is what you call inspiration. But is it good, the right inspiration? Is it correct? Maybe Jude is lying to us. 
But well, not that he's lying he because he says, and no man hath ascended to up to heaven. Jesus himself said that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, oh. he, he was with Jesus. I wonder if... Well, here, and so that's the problem. You see, if according to the biblical teaching, he should be still in his grave. But what happens in the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. There's Moses and Elijah coming down. Well, how did he, how did he get up there? So how would you say he's still in the grave? How do you know if there are more people that were raised up and taken to heaven? Just, well, they just haven't been written down. Well, you know, and that's the point. That's the point. How do we explain the fact that Moses was there to come down? And this is the only place. This is the only example we have in the whole Bible of what specifically says someone was raised to heaven or lived on this earth, went to heaven, came back, did something, and here's an explanation about how that all took place. This is the only place in the well, whole Bible. Well, you know, Jude knew Jesus. Mm -hmm. So maybe Jesus told Jude or told other people, and Jude was the only one that wrote it down that we have. Could it come straight from Jesus? Well, there's a bit of a problem here that we need to talk about. Okay. I'm going to make it more complicated. There is a copy of some copies of a book called The Assumption of Moses. Mm -hmm. We don't have the originals. We think that the originals were written maybe by some Pharisees. Again, that's in the days of Jesus. That's not way back somewhere. And that book which we only have copies of copies of, we don't even, and we have people referring to those copies, in fact. We don't have even copies of the original that say that there's, there's a time when Jesus was resurrected. So, but that book is an apocryphal book. It's not, a, it's not a gospel book. It's not a biblical book. So what's with Jude quoting from an apocryphal book? I thought Bible that's writers... What that's what inspiration does. It picks out the good things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay, but th does that mean that Jude said, hmm, this looks good, I think I'll pick it out? Could be. No, he did that under inspiration. He did that under inspiration. Okay, how do I know that this was done under inspiration and something else? Well, there is a story about the transfiguration. Where did Moses come from there? Yeah. So there's a little bit of a backup. A little bit of a backup. Okay. I think he spoke yeah, to Jesus. Well, well, not, how much it's is not illogical. Yeah, because that's, we don't have a record. It's his stepbrother. Remember, John says there's a lot of other stuff Jesus did, mm -hmm. and it, there's not enough books uh, around to, to write it all down. So that's not a, a well. That, the that, that's the other thing. Did Jesus just pull out ideas out of, even though they're the truth, just out of the air? Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the use of him going and studying the Bible or the scrolls if he could do that? He wouldn't even have to go study. He could just say, "I, I know everything." Okay. So now I'm going to make it. I'm what, not. What What Norm read earlier, all these these uh, metaphors that uh, are quoted here in uh, Jude 10 and and up to 13. Well, actually, several places. It's assumed that these people that he's writing to had understanding about those stories. Yes. Because those, those few words are loaded with yes. them. I mean, every one is a lesson in themselves. They're a whole story from the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah. And he's making an assumption that they know, he knows what, the, what, the refer, what he's referring to. They're like a cliche. And we talked about that back when we were talking about First John. In these last few books of the Bible, every one of these authors are assuming, because these are written way down at the end, they're assuming that the people they're writing to, and including us, if we're reading it, know all those stories, and so we know how to bring all that information into bear in our understanding of this text. Okay. And so that was, implies that there was, that was the uh, milieu, the, the culture, the, uh, was, was, those were familiar stories, uh, of uh, like we have today, we maybe use some familiar stories and just uh, all the time. Yeah, and 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 w when we get to the book of Revelation, we're going to see a lot of this, uh, and it's you know, it's believed that when John wrote the book of Revelation, if he had written it in plain what we would say ordinary everyday English, and really said, you know, the the, the nation of Rome is going to do this, and it's going to turn into a, uh, an impure church, and it's going to do, and he had main, named everything by its real name and so forth, the book would never have gotten off of the Isle of Patmos. Right. So God is using, in a sense, code language here 
in these places so that people will understand, hey, that's what's going on here. Um, you know, and, and we're assuming that you, as initiates, uh, understand it. Who, who was it that brought in the idea that only the initiated would understand what we're talking about? Jesus did that. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that was the great theme of the, the Gnostics, Gnostics, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> so there's a little bit of... But it says that Jesus taught in parables so that yeah. the, the others wouldn't understand what he was saying. Yeah. yeah. That isn't the only reason, though. No, but there's a... Well, a you know, that's why we need to study the Old Testament so we know what the New Testament says. Like, if a person uh, outside of our culture, maybe outside of the world, would hear uh, Apple computer... They might think a computer made out of an apple, you know, and, but we have all the knowledge to know what we're talking about when we say those two words. So he is doing the same thing, and it's up to us to learn the Old Testament so that we can understand the little code words that are in those verses, because there's several of them, and they have a whole history behind each, each couple of words. Mm -hmm. In engineering, they call those buzzwords. Buzzwords, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, buzzwords. L let's, um, le let's look at a couple of other things. Look at Jude, four, the 14th verse. There's only one chapter. It was Enoch, the seventh direct descendant from Adam. Now, we, uh, earlier we saw him going back and picking out a story that we didn't know anything about, or we didn't until we got to his book, about how Moses was resurrected and Jesus fought. And by the way, Actually, before I go to the Enoch thing, let's go back to that a second. Who is it that's fighting, who is it that's fighting over the body of Moses? It says Michael, oh. the archangel. Who's that? He's in... Uh, the one who's Daniel. like God. Uh -huh. He's in Daniel, several places. Mm -hmm. Any place else? Revelation. Revelation. 12, 7. Yeah. Who is it? Jesus. How do you know that? Well, the only one that was like God. Well, and where did you get that idea? The word Michael, actually, in Hebrew like means God. either a question who is like God or the one who is like God. And he's the archangel, could, which could be the, mean the beginning of all the angels or the chief of all the angels. It could have both of that. It could, or the first of the angels. It could mean any of those meanings. An angel means? Messenger. Messenger. Messenger, like that. Well, Jesus and a messenger is, would be from God to whomever else. So. That's right. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's a, better, a better answer Sorry, to that than that. L let's, let's take a little detour for just a second, because to know about the archang Michael the Archangels is really important. Uh, look at 1 at, um, Thessalonians chapter 4, and the famous verses that talk about what happens at the end. And it's... Um, Actually, let's go to verse 15, and, but we're going to focus on verse 16. I'm going to start with verse 15. What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. I'm reading from my Good News Bible. We who are alive on the day when the Lord comes. Now, it's interesting that Paul here suggest, is sort of implying that he thinks he's going to be alive when the Lord comes. Will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be the shout of command, the, what comes next? the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Okay, the archangel's voice. Okay, do we have any places else where it talks about what kind of voice raises the dead? I think that's God's voice. Look at John, the Gospel of John now, verse 28 and 29. Do not see... Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice and come out of their... Well, I'm sorry, I guess I should read verse 27. And he has given the Son the right to judge because he is the Son of Man. Still talking about Jesus. Jesus yeah. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves. Thessalonians says they will come out of the graves at the sound of what? The archangel's the voice. voice. Here it says they'll come out of the graves at the voice of... Jesus. So here we have a clear, putting the two, uh, John chapter 5 together with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we have evidence that it was, Jesus is the, is the archangel, okay? Question. Mm -hmm. If Elijah died and went to heaven before Jesus, does that give him... Elijah didn't die. He went uh, to that's what I meant, okay. If he went straight to heaven, 
before Jesus died and was re resurrected, does that give him preeminence over Jesus' work? No. No, no. He was taken to heaven by a power way beyond his own. Jesus did it on his own. He did it with a credit card. <laughs> no. Well, you know, <laughs> Jesus had a lot of names. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lamb of God, oh, yeah, the Counselor, of the Judah, the Counselor, the Comforter, da da da, on, on and on and on. And so, Michael the Archangel is another one of these descriptive names mm -hmm. for yeah, Jesus. It's interesting that it that what that what that name implies, though. Here you have an eternal God, talked about as the Archangel. Mm -hmm. If he was an angel to the angels, and he came down here to be human to humanity, mm -hmm. that says kind of an interesting role that he has played throughout eternity. Do you think yeah. God wants to get close to his creation, so God enters his creation, whatever in the angels, he may enter another world, and, and he entered ours as Jesus? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, that's interesting. That that's very important. But God wants to be so close to us and to his creation that he, he enters into his right. creation. Now, someone mentioned, I think Jim, you were the one mentioned, that Michael the archangel is mentioned also in Daniel. Do you remember where? Daniel 12, 1, isn't it? Look at that. We're going we're gonna to try to get an idea um, of why this is happening like this. The angel wearing, I'm reading from Daniel 12, 1, the angel wearing linen clothes said, at that time, the great angel Michael, who guards your people, will appear. Then there will be a time of troubles, the worst since nations first came into existence. When that time comes, all the people of your nation whose names are written in God's book will be saved. Many of those who have already died will live again. Some will enjoy eternal life, etc. And he said to me, and now Daniel, close the book and seal the book and so forth. And if you, read, if you read chapter 11, which we don't have to read time to read the whole chapter 11, it talks about all the evil things Satan has been, done, has been doing. Now in chapter, beginning of chapter 1, Michael is going to stand up. So what we discover here is that all through the Bible, he's called Michael the archangel when he's facing off directly with whom? The devil. With the devil. It's in contrast. So it's Satan... The deceiver is always in contrast with Michael, the one who is like God. That's what the name means, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's important to recognize that. Deceiver, Diabolos, etc., Michael, the archangel. So many so-called Christians don't understand what, what, Jesus, what the Michael really means. Yeah. Well, it's like son of God, isn't it? The, Michael? Yeah. Well, Michael means the one who is like God, man. literally. So, yeah. are you saying that Michael the archangel is the one that faces off with and, and in, has conflict with Satan? It's always Michael the archangel, and he, Michael always becomes victorious. Yes. Yeah. It's interesting. The Bible, apparently, for whatever reason, we could think a lot of reasons maybe, but for whatever reason, the Bible... When it, when it talks about Jesus in direct conflict with the devil, it calls him Michael the Archangel. That sounds like a kind of a controversy, doesn't it? <laughs> a we, great controversy. A great controversy. We talk about that all the time, don't we? So here we have the two leaders of the two sides, Michael the Archangel, otherwise known as Jesus, alias the Son of God, the Son, etc., etc., and we have the devil, the former Lucifer, Satan, Diabolos, the deceiver coming up from the abyss, etc. So we're going to talk a lot more about that when we get to the book of Revelation. But right now, we need to take a break. Don't go away. We're going to be right back.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We've been talking about a very interesting phenomenon through Scripture, the fact that when Christ is in direct conflict with the devil, he is called Michael the Archangel. Does that occur in any other places that you can think about? I want to mention one other one. What about Revelation 12? Remember what happens in Revelation 12? Now, a war rose in heaven, starting with verse 7. Yes. Back up a little bit farther, to, uh, earlier. Well, His tail swept down to the third of the stars of heaven. We're talking about the dragon. Yes. Okay. But look at verse 7. Then war broke, broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Who was the dragon? Who fought back with his angels. But the <clears throat> dragon was defeated, and he and his, his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. So again, we have a clear evidence of Michael the archangel is a name that's used to describe Jesus when he's in direct conflict with, with Satan. I wish he'd have put in, in Revelation there that he'd been deceiving in heaven. Yeah. It would have been an easier parallel to make. Yeah. It's, isn't there, in, in Daniel, though, doesn't he talk to Daniel and say that I was contending with a, the guardian of... Yeah, that's in Daniel 9. That's another place. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Was that Michael or was that Gabriel? That was Gabriel, but it, it, this, it, he, calls, he calls Michael. Mm -hmm. Do you think Satan is getting pretty frustrated by now? Because every single battle he's had with Michael the Archangel. But the Satan looks around our world and he says, God, I can, I can hardly see your people at all. Look at all the people who are on my side. I'm going to win this. And when it comes down to the final plagues at the end, Ellen White says very clearly that Satan is going to do everything possible to, he can do to get rid of God, to destroy God's people, and then he, what he hopes to say is, okay, God, just leave this world to us. Leave with me with my people here. We'll have this world. You can, you can have the rest of the universe. Go do your thing, but leave this world to me and my people. I have a question. In that revelation, uh, does the original have cast out to this earth? Yes. Cast down to this earth. Cast down. Because this one just has cast out. doesn't say to where. Oh, you want to know what the, Hebrew, what the Greek yeah, says? Yeah, yeah. Well, hold on. We'll go back there a moment. Uh, here. There's no longer any being place just cast, cast out of heaven would be quite different than being cast to the Fall earth. down. And Jesus had said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. So, mm -hmm. from heaven. It doesn't say the doesn't give the impact point. It says, thrown down, he, was, he was thrown down to the earth. Ground zero. Verse, verse nine. I, I think that's, it's got to be the That was come down to you. Where would that be? He was thrown down to earth. Where would that be? Verse 9. Let where, me just, where's, where's he thrown down to earth? At the verse end 13. of verse, verse 9. nine. It also. says specific, yeah. The Greek says specifically earth. Okay, it was just left out. In the, yeah. Verse 13 also says down to yes. the earth. Yeah. Oh, what fun for us. So Satan and his angels are running around here, huh? Yeah, they Okay, well, it, 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 we, we don't have forever to, uh, to finish up here. Let's go back to, um, to Jude. Okay. And I'd like to look at Jude 14. We talked about Jude apparently quoting a story about the assumption of Moses and all the implications of that. Can, can I apologize? Yeah. Before we go there, it... it if we're, le if we're going to leave verse 9, I'd like to say one, okay. mention one thing about verse 9. You know, I meet a lot of people and they've, they've got a lot of things to say about the devil. Mm -hmm. And kind of bad-mouthing the devil, which we know the devil's no good. Maybe he deserves it. Hmm? He, he deserves whatever. But it's kind of scary because here it says, even Michael the archangel wouldn't say those things. He's going to just, I'm going to let God the Father do it. Well, I, I'm, I'm, it's interesting that you mention that. There's a, there's a story that I've heard in the past, a very interesting one, about a lady who, who lived in a church, and she would never say anything about anybody that wasn't good. 
And people notice this after a while, and they, they actually sort of bait her to try to see what, what, what good thing. Finally, someone just kind of says, okay, tell me what you, what, what, you, what you have to say about the devil. And she thought for a moment, well, she says, he certainly is a persistent fellow. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in his persistence, we should let, we should let God handle him. Yes. We because God, ha God can contain all of that persistence. So let's not play now, with the fire. Let's if Jude, yeah, if Jude borrowed the idea of Moses being as uh, ascended from apocryphal sources, what about verse 14? It was Enoch, the seventh direct descendant from Adam, who long ago prophesied this about them, the Lord will come with many thousands of his holy angels to bring judgment on all, to condemn them all for the godless deeds they have performed and for all the terrible words that godless sinners have spoken against him. And it's in quotation marks. Isn't there, is there a book of Enoch that we know about? Yes. There is. There's four there's, of them. There's four of them. And the, and this is this almost a direct quote from the first book of Enoch. So he's saying that Enoch actually said this because That's it's in saying. quotes. Mm -hmm. And there was, there's one book of Enoch that, that goes into this. The, the angels had relationships with men. All kinds of and stuff. And all like kinds that. of stuff like that. Yes. Okay. So you had to be kind of pick and choose through that book, I think. <laughs> I mean, well, you can pick a beautiful lily out of a rotten swamp. Okay. Inspiration allows people to do that. <laughs> okay. If indeed it was picked from that particular... Well, if indeed it was. I mean, the point is it's irrelevant. <coughs> Excuse okay. Me. <laughs> but critics will look at this and say, you know, you, you, you... See, we have said... Critics are critics. Yeah. That's all they are. But well, I would like to know <coughs> how he found this information out because I, I'd like to find new sources of information. Well, yeah. he just didn't happen to tell you where he got it. Yeah, well, he, he, he <laughs> it certainly looks like he quoted it from First Enoch. That's fine. Well, here, this, the footnotes on this says, the source of this information was the Holy Spirit who inspired Jude. The <laughs> fact that it was recorded in the non-biblical and pseudo-epigraphical pseudo book of Enoch had no effect on its accuracy. See, in, see interpretive challenges. So okay. this is an interpretive challenge. Yes, that's why okay, we're I'm talking about it. I'm speechless now. I guess that's it. <laughs> 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 well, here we have, and, and there you see the two sides. Critics would say, this guy is just throwing in a lot of junk into his book here, and an <laughs> uninspired source, etc. And we, who believe in the inspiration of Scripture, would say, well, Maybe there, was a, maybe there was another inspired source that we've lost, and Enoch quoted from it, whoever wrote Enoch. Enoch was written by probably some Pharisees again, somewhere around the first or second century B.C., but it was written before Jude, very clearly written before Jude, first or second century B.C., an a pseudepigraphical book, falsely entitled, falsely, because obviously it wasn't written by Enoch. We know for sure it wasn't written by Enoch. Mm, that was and, before the flood. Yeah, he was back before the flood. The seventh from Adam here. And yet here it is. And maybe maybe Jude was quoted from another source. We just don't know. But we do we do know that it is in Enoch and it's here. And that shouldn't bother us a bit. The truth is, the, the question is, did Enoch say such a thing? You did real did the real Enoch did say the such real, a thing? Because that's what he says here. Enoch well, said then, this. Well, if he says so, I until I have a reason to say that it couldn't be, I want to take it. From, yeah. Because he said it did. And, and that's, no. that points out very clearly the difference between two approaches to interpreting Scripture. There's the maximalist approach and there's a the minimalist approach. The maximalist approach says anything the Bible says that can't be disproved must be true. The millennialist minimalist <laughs> approach is unless I can substantiate it and prove it from another source, then the Bible must be wrong. And here we have a perfect example. I would, of, I would expect the devil to have some kind of a thing like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, you wouldn't say, you wouldn't have to say it was wrong. You just say, you can't say it's right either. Yeah. So it's kind of... That sounds like the Jesus seminar types. Mm -hmm. <laughs> two, <laughs> two quick points is uh, whether or not Enoch said it, what is said in the quotations is certainly true. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones 
to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they have done in the ungodly way and, and of all the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So that, that much is true. And then if you think about it, why would Enoch not have said that? Hmm. Certainly Enoch must have said something to that, but that nature in his that, preaching. That sort, of, that sort of doesn't give us permission to sort of put words in his mouth. That's true. That's true. Yes, but Enoch was one who had a very close walk with God. Yes. And Moses had yes. a very close walk with God. We know that Moses was shown the whole history, yeah. the, the future history. So maybe God and Enoch were having a chat and, and God said, hey, yeah, that, here's the way it's going to yeah, be. Yeah. No, no, I mean, that's very possible. The question is, how did Jude find out? Well, you know, the middle... Oh, it started with, with the word of mouth, because that's the way things were done back in Enoch's yeah. time. That's a long time. Would the minimal, minimalist believe in creation or the resurrection no. or the ascension? Mostly. So they would not believe in any of that. It has to be sort of dug up in the sand, archaeology, before they say, oh, okay, this sentence is true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's at least one more thing we really need to look at in the book of, of Jude, which is really important, and we'll get on to it. We'll, we'll hit it again when we get to the book of Revelation. And it's found in, in uh, verses 6 and verse 7. Uh, Jude 6 and verse... And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode. Now, we read about that in Revelation 12, didn't we? He is kept in eternal bonds... What are the eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day? Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulge in... I'm reading now from the New American Standard Bible, by the way. In gross immorality and went after strange flesh are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So, why don't we all take a trip over to the Holy Land and watch Sodom burn? Have you been yeah. to Sodom and Gomorrah? What are they now? Are they I'm sand? I'm looking for the fire. <laughs> are they sand in the desert or? Well, we, we think that they're buried under the Dead Sea. Mm. Whatever, if there's anything left of them. It's on the lower end of the Dead Sea. Maybe the Dead Sea is, is shrinking and shrinking. They're taking so much water out of the Jordan River that almost none is coming in and it's evaporating because it's a hot place. Uh, maybe someday they'll find some. <laughs> but Sod Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah are not burning still today. It says they're burning of eternal fire. Their eternal fire acts as a, an example. <laughs> what, what is eternal supposed to mean? It killed as them all. As long as it lasts. <laughs> well, as long as they were living, it was going to be still burning. Yeah. Eternally for them. Do, do we have any other examples of the use of the word eternal that may be... Look at Exodus 21 and verse 6. In the ancient times, it was possible for a person to... Many, many people became slaves. Most of them probably because they couldn't pay their debts. So they would become slaves for a period of time to, to get money to pay their debts. And then they would be finished... They finished their, their, their time period and then they'd be free again. So forth. And, but once in a while, what would happen is a person would be a slave for a period of time, and maybe while they were slaves, they would, they would, the, the master would give them a wife, for example, and maybe they would they really come to love that wife, and they might have children with that wife, and he would say, well, I don't want to leave. I mean, my life is comfortable here. I like the person I'm working for. He's taking good care of me. I have a wife now. I have children. Because if, if, you, if your wife was given to you uh, by... The master, if you left on your own, you would leave without your wife. The, 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 the wife and the, and the child would still belong to the master. So a slave might actually say, I, I'm going to choose to remain with you for the rest of my life. What would happen in such a case? Well, Exodus 21, verse 6 tells us, Then his master shall bring him to God, and, and actually it says to the doorpost of the temple, Then he shall bring him to the door or the, or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and I wonder how many ear piercings are eternal now in our day. And he shall serve him. And my, my good news, I mean, my New American Standard Bible says, 
permanently. But you know what it says in the original language? Eternally, right? Forever. Forever. You shall serve him forever. This will give us a clue when we get to Revelation how to interpret the word eternal, everlasting, forever. Okay? Okay, well, we've got uh, just a few minutes left. I want to go back to 2nd and 3rd John because we don't want to leave those books completely. Uh, sorry to interrupt you again. As we finish Jude, I'd like to say, again, a lot of hard things in there. But verse 22, mm-hmm. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, mm-hmm. hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. I love those last couple of verses, 24 and 25. It's been made into a scripture song. It's one of my very favorite scripture songs. It's so, it's so wonderful. Anyway, we'll go back now. What do we know about the two short books, 2nd and 3rd John? Well, um, they were written after Revelation. Okay. After the Gospel of John. After the Gospel of John, there were there were five books that were very slow to be to be recognized by some of the of the early Christians uh, in in well in the days following the apostles. Those five books were James, Second Peter, Second and Third John, and Jude. Why do you suppose those books would be slow in being recognized? James is the 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 younger. The um, older brother of Jesus. Yeah, I know, but um, it was the first book written, they think. It may have been. May it have been. Mm-hmm. Because I was thinking maybe because they were newer, and newer things take a while to... No. All, these, all these books are telling people to do good, do good, do good. Yeah. That you will be known by your fruits. Mm-hmm. That if you're a Christian, you are going to act certain ways. Mm-hmm. And, well, with God helping you. Is that it? It seems like all of them are um, show your That's fruit. A factor. Another factor is their size. These oh, are little small. tiny books, so they're not they're not great careful theological treatises spell out all about the gospel, something like that, or or the entire story of Jesus, like one of the gospels, or the story of the church, like the book of Acts. These are little tiny books, and little tiny books, you know. They, they sort of fall in the cracks and, and, and they don't get as much recognition as the big, bigger books do. That may be another reason why they were slower in being received. Is Second John the shortest in the Bible? Second John is the shortest in the Bible. It's maybe, what, four paragraphs? Something like that. Yeah. Well, look at Second John just briefly. From the elder, who would that be? To the dear lady and to her children whom I truly love. I am not the only one, but all who, lo- who know the truth love you, because the truth remains in us and will be with us forever. I'm going to read the whole book. Who do you suppose the elder is here? Mine says to the chosen. Oh, the elder. From uh, the elder. That John is elder. He's very yeah. elderly. Very elderly, and he was known as the elder in those days. Who was the dear lady? Mine says chosen lady, and it says metaphorically to a particular local church, and her children would and her children would refer to members of the congregation. Why would it say that? Just because it does. Down here. <laughs> Disguised, perhaps written from Pathmos Island, prison. No, probably not. Probably written later. But a clue is the last verse. Look at the very last verse in Second John. The children of your dear sister send you their greetings. Is that the neighboring church? That's the church where John is. So that's what I meant when I said what I did, it, meaning in code. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. to the chosen lady, mm-hmm. the church, yes. and her children, as Joanne said, her, the worshipers, the followers, the believers. So you could write a letter like this. Remember, John was writing at a time when... Christians were being persecuted. You could write a letter like this, and it sounds like, oh, you're writing to your dear sister, whatever, but he's really writing about the church, isn't he? Greetings to your children yeah. from our children. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, anything else interesting about this book? Mm. 
Well, look at verse 7. Many deceivers have gone out all over the world, people who do not acknowledge that Jesus Christ came as a human being. Does that sound like something we read maybe when we were talking about 1 John? Yes, yes in another uh, program you were mentioning about the... Uh, Gnosticism? Docetism? Docetism. Docetism. Uh, which is a part of Gnosticism, yes. Those who do not believe that Jesus came in the flesh. And he just put punches it right out. Such a person is a deceiver and the enemy of Christ. Be on your guard then so you will not lose what you have worked for, what we have worked for, but will receive your reward in full. This, this is, yeah, this one, he's a deceiver and an antichrist. Right. Yeah, <laughs> enemy of Christ, antichrist, that's about the same. Uh, look at the final words here. I have so much to tell you, but I would rather not do it with pen and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you personally so that we shall be completely happy. What is that? He does that, uh, that your joy may be complete. He does that in 1 John. He does yeah. it in 2 John. And he did it in the Gospel of John mm -hmm. it, it, uh, several times. Mm -hmm. That your joy may be full. Your if, you, if you analyze the language here, the, these three short letters in the Gospel of John, very much alike. Very much alike. Yeah. But what, what about these final words? I would rather not do it with paper and ink. What do you think? Is that because he might uh, get in trouble? Well, if he said too much, it might be a problem. And the size of this letter, what do you suppose it, how, how, how big would it be? Maybe a half sheet? Yeah, it's another one of those, no more than one page on a papyrus, depending on how big you write, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, I'm running out, basically I'm running out of paper here. Paper was very expensive in those days. Running out of paper here. But, but that's okay because I'm going to come and see you pretty quick. That's okay because I'm going to come and see you pretty quick. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's too bad. He should have kept, found some more paper. <laughs> he could use some more. <laughs> that would have been nice. Well, look over at Third John. It's an interesting, another short book, another one-pager. From the Elder. So now we've, we already know that that's talking about John, isn't it? To my dear Gaius, whom I truly love. Who's Gaius? Mm. We have no idea. He probably was the head of a church somewhere in Asia Minor. John, writing probably from Ephesus, was writing to the leader of this church. It says, Not, This name was one of 18 common names from which Roman parents usually chose a name for one of their sons. So that was a common name. Yeah, yeah. My dear friend, I pray that everything may go well with you and that you may be in good health as I know you're well in spirit. We use that verse a lot, don't we? You, you have the King James. Well, both of you do. One, would one of you just read that in the King James? We quote that very often. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. Yeah, that thou mayest prosper and be in health. Is that part of the gospel? even as your soul prospers. Mm -hmm. So he wants us to prosper, and Gaius and everyone, is that, the, oh, as if, well as our soul. The, the Israelites were promised, if you get along and do, do well, I won't put any of these diseases on you. Yep. So I think it's appropriate. Yeah. Well, you know what this says? It says John's prayer for Gaius is significant, because Gaius, is that how you say it? His spiritual state was so excellent that John prayed that his physical health would match his spiritual vigor. Yeah, exactly. Well, and maybe this has something to do with the fact that Jesus spent more time in healing than he did in preaching and teaching. In other words, if you're sick and you're really under the weather, it's hard to, to, to think clearly about God or to learn anything about God and so forth. So this is why health, good health, is a part of the Christian message, right? Mm-hmm. Well, he doesn't always say the same thing about everybody. Look at verse 9 in 3 John here. I wrote a short letter to the church, but Biotrephes, who likes to be their leader, will not pay any attention to what I say. This is somebody who decided that he's going to oppose John. When I come then, I will call attention to everything he has done, the terrible things he says about us, and the lies he tells. Well, here's a personal devil, isn't it? But that is not enough for him. He will not receive our fellow Christians when they come and even stops those who want to receive them and tries to drive them out of the church. 
So who's, what's he really saying here? What kind of people is he talking about? Mm, is he have a code word here again? He's calling out they're, names, that's for sure. They're infiltrators. Well, in those days, <coughs> there were people, th there were several level, levels of, of people who ministered to the Christian churches. There were some who were just local people. Maybe they had a full-time business, but when they had, oper well, every, say every weekend or whatever, they would help, to, maybe the, the, the local church would meet in their homes or something like that. They, would, they were local ministers in a sense. There were others who would travel around in a small area, and, and they were sometimes called prophets, and they would, they would minister to several churches. And when they would come to your church, it would be expected you would do what? Invite them. Take care you would take care of them, provide a home for them, etc. And this Diotrephes is saying, nothing do it. We'll, we'll do fine here. I, I don't need any help. Don't send me. And then, of course, there were the apostles, and they traveled far and wide. So there were three levels of people sort of traveling around trying to spread the gospel here. And, but then he says, verse 12, everyone speaks well. Demetrius, truth itself speaks well of him. And we add our testimony. You know that what we say is true. And then he says again, I have so much to tell you, but I do not want to do it with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and then we will talk personally. Peace be with you. All your friends send greetings. Greet all our friends personally. So in these four books, actually, First John we talked about last week, and Second and Third John and Jude we talked about this week, we have seen that uh, these, these church leaders were dealing with some really challenging problems. People who denied the divinity of Christ, people who denied the humanity of Christ, people who were coming into the churches trying to spread corruption and so forth like this, and these people are stepping up to the plate and they're being very firm and very definitive. And they're saying, we're not taking this for a second lying down. You know, Jesus was fully human. He was fully God. These corruptors who are trying to mess things up, they're wrong. Throw them out in effect. Get rid of these people. Don't let them, don't listen to them. Don't have anything to do with them. And they've quoted, Jude quotes the example of Moses. He quotes the example of Enoch. And where we got those examples from, we're not sure, but it doesn't matter. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion of these short books. See you next week.